Just across the Z190 chipset, MSI offers a whopping 11 motherboards of various prices and feature sets. Now they've been kind enough to send us their Meg Z490 Ace for review, a motherboard just one step below their finest offering, the Godlike. Whilst it isn't as pricey, it certainly is an expensive motherboard at $400, but as we hope to show you, it's a deserved price tag and well worth the money. Intel's new Comet Lake S CPUs warranted a new socket, LGA1200, and a new chipset, the Z490. The new chipset ushers in Wi-Fi 6 support and 2.5 gigabit LAN. Those with Core i7 or Core i9s will now have official support for 2933 MHz memory, an upgrade over Z390's 2666 MHz. That said, you can still run memory with an XMP at 3200 MHz or higher if you want, but these aren't officially supported. The final difference is PCIe 4 support at a hardware level, provided the motherboard has the required clock generators, PCIe slots and M.2 connectors, you'll be able to utilise PCIe Gen 4 to the fullest. In the here and now though, we're stuck with PCIe Gen 3. Real quick, the test system is a Core i5-10600K, a Fractal Design S28 AIO, G-Skills 3600MHz DDR4 RAM C16 timings, and an RTX 2080 Ti. CPU power comes in the form of two 8-pin ATX 12V connectors and power delivery consists of an Intersil ISL69269 PWM controller with 16 ISL99390 90-amp smart power stages. Whilst MSI advertise this as a 16 plus 1 phase, it is in fact an 8 by 2 plus 1 phase design as it utilises 8 Intersil ISL6617A phase doublers which can be seen on the back of the motherboard. Don't get it twisted though, this is an over-engineered power delivery system that can easily handle an overclocked i9-10900K with all power limits removed. As such, the heat sinks aren't necessary but they're good to have However, there is a VRM fan that is wholly redundant. It appears that the ACE uses through-hole capacitors instead of the more expensive surface mount capacitors as we've seen on the Godlike. Otherwise, the power delivery system is identical to the $700 Godlike. One thing to note is that the remaining plus one phase is for the system agent, not integrated graphics. This means no graphics output, evident from the lack of HDMI and display ports on the back and no quick sync support if you planned on using that. When it comes to onboard features regarding overclocking, there is quite a lot on offer. There's a power button, a reset button, or it's dubbed a smart button, which can also be toggled to safe boot, turbo fan, and easy LED control. The board even includes what MSI calls V checkpoints just here. They're voltage checkpoints to measure the live system voltages of CPU, DDR, VCCSA, the system agent, and VCC IO. In terms of onboard LEDs, we've got quite a few. Easy debug LEDs indicate the debug status of the motherboard, be it CPU, DRAM, VGA, or boot. A simple XMP LED indicates that the extreme memory profile has been loaded. And there is a debug LED display just there, and that's used to monitor post progress and errors and during system use, it seemed to monitor overall system temperature of the CPU. Finally, there is an easy LED control switch that can be switched to turn all motherboard LEDs on or off, and that is just here. There are a plethora of jumpers, with the most notable being OC fail, or as it's more commonly known, fail set jumper. Now this retains the settings of a previously failed overclock, and skips the corresponding failed overclock message and gets you straight back into the BIOS. The CMOS battery has a bit of an awkward placement just under the graphics card, so if you populate that, you're a bit out of luck. But luckily, they've included a clear CMOS button on the rear I.O., so not too bad. And as it lacks any form of dual BIOS, the inclusion of a BIOS flashback with a dedicated USB port is very handy in case you corrupt the BIOS via overclocking or just mishaps. Now, when you enter the BIOS, it's littered with options for overclocking to the point that even an expert would probably be lost. A novel entry is per-core hyperthreading, a new addition with Intel's 10th gen processors, something that might allow for higher individual per-core overclocks. Voltage controls also abundance here, um, usual V-core, VCC-IO and VCC-SA with 
just a wealth of other options. Now in software, if you use MSI's Dragon Center for overclocking, it isn't as feature packed, but there's still a great deal of control over the usual frequency features and voltages as you'd expect. Now obviously it does lack a few features, but it is handy for quickly testing certain settings, but otherwise there's not too much negative to say regarding the Dragon Center software. Now memory, the DIMM slots are reinforced with MSI's signature steel armor, which apparently helps reduce electromagnetic interference. For memory power delivery, we've got a single phase VDDR with three MOSFETs, four Z02N high side and two four Z024N low side, both from on semiconductor. The traces from the CPU to the DIMM slots are tabbed and that's meant to reduce crosstalk. The board does support a maximum of 128 gigs of non-ECC unbuffered memory and supported frequencies vary depending on the DIMM configuration per channel and rank. Two DIMMs per channel, two rank configuration has a max rated speed of 4000 plus megahertz according to the manual and online. So if you plan on populating two DIMM slots, this is an excellent board for memory overclocking. In a similar fashion to CPU overclocking, the BIOS and Dragon Center software give you all you could need for memory overclocking. There are the usual options like XMP, frequency, timings, and memory try it, in addition to the DRAM voltage controls. However, the DRAM training configuration and advanced DRAM configuration bring a new and somewhat overwhelming amount of control for memory overclocking, and you'd be lucky to understand what half of those options mean. Again, this motherboard and its BIOS offer so much control, it's not even funny. It is an overclocker's dream. On to cooling and it's in abundance with this motherboard. A total of six four pin system fan headers that populate the board with a further two for CPU fan and water pump. All three M.2 slots have their own heatsink or M.2 shield frozer as MSI call it, each with a pre-applied thermal pad and removing all three of them reveals the chipset heatsink. The RM heatsink is two giant blocks, quadruple finned, connected by a single heat pipe, and that sits towards the rear I.O. here, and there is a fan just between the heatsink and the rear I.O. that seems unnecessary given the power delivery system MSI has opted for. Flipping over the muffler board, and we can see the MOSFET backplates. These and the heat sinks feature respectable seven watt per meter Kelvin thermal pads. Fan control is done via the BIOS or the aforementioned Dragon Center software. Curves can be created for all attached fans, including the one for the MOSFET, which, by the way, can reach an incredible 12,000 RPM. Options here include motor control, temperature source, step up and step down times, or something you'd call hysteresis. Smart fan mode will allow you to build a four point fan curve via a temperature versus duty cycle graph. And there's also a simple, just manual fan control if you just want a static fan speed. The Dragon Center software is a bit less useful for controlling the fans. Manual fan control is limited to 25, 50, 75, and 100%. And Smart Fan only provides a four point control with no options for temperature, source, or hysteresis. Fan Tune is an unexplained addition to the software, which does some kind of fan curve optimization, but I'm not too sure what. So from personal experience, I would just create a fan curve to my taste of noise and temperature. With a verbal tour over, let's take a look at how well the MSI Meg Z490 Ace fared in our thermal torture tests. With an ambient of about 22 degrees, we saw heat sink temperatures of about 53 on the top and 52 on the side, and the chipset measured 38 degrees. Overclocked, we saw it go as high as 59 on each and the chipset 40 degrees again. Obviously then 60 degrees on an overclocked 10600K pulling about 250 watts, more than capable of handling a i9-10900K. Onto storage and this motherboard's got a total of six, six gigabit per second SATA ports and as I've said, three M.2 slots. They all support Intel's Optane memory and RAID but RAID 10 is limited to SATA storage devices. For now, each M.2 slot supports a maximum of PCI 3 by 4. First supports the 22110 standard and below, whilst the remaining two are limited to 2280 and below. It's also worth noting that certain SATA ports will be disabled with the use of certain M.2 slots, so be sure to check our website for the table and find your desired configuration. Onto expansion slots, and there's obviously a wealth of them. It touts three PCIe 3 by 16 slots, with the first slot capable of 4 by 16 speed, the second by 8, and the third by 4. 
There's also two PCIe 3 by one slots in both size and lanes, just here and here. And they're provided by the chipset. The board is officially licensed for multi-GPU technologies, two-way SLI, limit for NVIDIA cards, but three-way crossfire for AMD. If you're just going to install a single graphics card though, then it's recommended to put it in the top slot. MSI has incorporated an Intel AX201 CRF module for Wi-Fi 6 support, a Realtek 8125B 2.5 gigabit LAN for 2.5 gigabit LAN, and a Intel i219V 1 gigabit LAN for additional networking support. A Wi-Fi antenna is included, but you can still receive a connection without it. Obviously, it will improve the signal. It's also worth noting that even though it is Wi-Fi 6, it is backwards compatible and I had no problem connecting to my wireless 802.11ac router. MSI's LAN manager has priority control for applications with the ability to completely block the connection for a given application, as well as limit its upload speed. Strangely, throttling download speed is absent, which would have been nice. There's also a Wi-Fi analysis page which details the channel, frequency and signal strength of nearby wireless networks and a handy chart which is useful for identifying overlapping networks. On to audio and once again we see Realtek's ALC1220 codec. It provides some of the best integrated 7.1 HD audio on motherboard so it's no surprise that it's been included. But MSI has gone one step further by including the ESS Sabre 901 AQ2C, a mobile DAC and headphone amp with high dynamic range and low total harmonic distortion. All audio circuitry is placed towards the left of the motherboard and Nippon Chemicon capacitors supplement it. A lot of work has been put into isolating the audio via the use of separate PCB layers for the left and right channels. And a novel but welcome addition is D-pop protection that mitigates the pop sound you'd usually hear when you plug in or unplug a device. The rear audio connectors are gold plated, but the IO shield adorns the black and gold aesthetic that MSI have gone for, so color coding for the usual 5.1, 7.1 setup has been lost. When it came to real world testing, I was pleasantly surprised by both the quality and power of audio delivered. Only 8% volume in Windows was needed to drive a pair of Audio Technica ATH M50Xs, where the MSI MPG X570. Pro Carbon required about 14%. Obviously not a impedance heavy headphone set, but it bodes well for those. With similar volume set, I tested a few songs, movies with True HD audio and games, and I found the Ace to produce a flatter, more natural sound. In comparison, the X570 sounded a little boomy, especially in the low end. I discussed the software features of audio in greater depth in my article, but I'll just briefly mention that Nahimic, I think, control panel which comes with a well-implemented night mode for nighttime listening. EQ is quite crude, covering just bass, voices and treble, with a 12 decibel reduction or gain. Raising voices too much can give them a, like, a walkie-talkie sound that ruins the audio. There's also a fake surround sound option included, but it obviously won't compare to a real 7.1 headset like the Kraken X I tested with. And it also seems to add a thinness to the sound and is best described as a kind of reverb effect. There's a sound tracker overlay, which uses a radar in supported games, but I didn't have any supported games at the time, so it didn't work in Horizon Zero Dawn. The supported game list also seems quite sparse, but I used the demo built into the software and it seems like it would work well, giving you an unfair advantage in the games that do support it. USB and Thunderball is as you'd expect. There's the old PS2 port for those of us with interrupt-based keyboards and mice. Two USB 2 ports, two USB 3.2 Gen 1, five gigabit per second ports, and three USB 3.2 Gen 2 or 10 gigabit per second ports. The Asmedia 3241 chipset affords a final USB 3.2 Gen 2x2, 20 gigabit per second USB Type-C port. Over to the headers on the motherboard, and there's plenty on offer here too. USB 3.2 Gen 2, 10 gigabits per second, a 3.2 Gen 1, 5 gigabit per second for two Type-A ports, 
and two USB 2 headers for a total of four additional USB 2 ports. For those of you that use Thunderbolt, you'll be pleased to know it supports here with a Thunderbolt add-on card connector and even an Intel RTD3 connector for compatible Thunderbolt I.O. cards. There's a final piece of chest armor I haven't discussed yet, which furnishes the back of the motherboard. This one. Um, it runs all the way down the length of the motherboard and it doesn't seem to do too much for cooling. I think it's more for reinforcing the board to reduce sag with heavy tower coolers or heavy graphics cards. It's got RGB. The shroud for the rear IO is adorned with what I can only assume is the letter A for Ace. And the colors and patterns can be controlled in the same way as they can for the slither of RGB on the chipset heatsink. I'm not a personal fan of RGB, but MSI's implementation here is in keeping with the black and gold scheme. Fortunately, it can be disabled through the Mystic Light software as part of the Dragon Control Center if you find RGB completely abhorrent. If you're on the other side of the coin though and you can't get enough, then you'll be pleased with the RGB headers available. The Ace has a four pin RGB LED connector for 5050 12 volt strips or system fans, two three pin rainbow LED connectors for WS2812 b individually addressable RGB five volt strips, or a system fan and one three pin Corsair LED connector, again for individually adjustable Lighting Pro RGB five volt strips or Corsair RGB fans. And with that, we come to the end of our review. For me, the biggest draw to this motherboard is the build quality. It's hard to put into words just how well built this thing is. Days after my initial unboxing, I'm still impressed by it and would be happy to pay the current asking price of $400. Sweetening the deal is the board's feature set, a top tier power delivery system with 90 amp smart power stages that run exceptionally cool, even with a CPU sucking close to 250 watts. At a touch under 60 degrees centigrade with the overclocked 10600K under an intense AVX workload, it's clear the VRMs are overkill and more than enough for even the most professional of overclockers. Staying on the subject of overclocking, it's worth reiterating that many useful buttons, displays and jumpers are available. The fail set jumper alone makes this board worth considering for extreme overclockers and the base clock header, slow boot and LN2 jumpers further this. The sheer number of settings in the BIOS for CPU and memory overclocking is simply overwhelming and again shows this board is for serious overclockers. For your day-to-day -day use though, as an average user, there are plenty of other features to get excited about. The three PCIe by 16 expansion slots and M.2 slots are PCIe 4 ready for whenever Rocket Lake is and the multitude of fan and RGB headers will satisfy those with fan heavy cases and RGB fiends alike. Precise fan control means custom tailored fan curves suited to temperatures and noise. And finally, the audio is quite literally loud and clear thanks to the included Sabre DAC from ESS. So that was the MSI Meg Z490 Ace, an exceptional motherboard, well worth the $400 price tag Build quality is exceptional and overclocking features are in abundance. If you're interested in this board, be sure to check it out in the link in the description below and check out the article for further details and tables, like I've said, on the expansion slots and M.2 slot configurations. But that's it from me. If you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like and subscribe. And thank you for watching.